was soaked in sunlight, or what passed for sunlight here on Warlawn. The sunset tones of high noon were slanting through the window, and dust motes drifted lazily through the broad beam. The light fell so that only one side of the mattress was illuminated. Gwen lay half in and half out of shadow. Dirk, he did not speak again to Gwen or look at her, found himself watching the patterns the light made on the floor. In the center of the chamber, everything was warm and red, and it was here the dust danced, drifting in from the darkness and turning briefly crimson, briefly golden, throwing tiny shadows until it drifted out of the light again and was gone. He raised his hand, held it out for minutes, hours, for a time. It grew warm and warmer. Dust swirled around it. Shadows fell away like water when he twitched and turned his fingers. The sun was friendly and familiar. But suddenly he became aware that the movement of his hand, like the endless whirling of dust, had no purpose, no pattern, and no meaning. It was the music that told him so. The music of Lamia Bayliss. He pulled his hand in and frowned. Around the great center of light and life was a thin twisting border where the sun shone through the window's rim of black and blood-stained glass or fought through. It was only a small border, but it sealed the land of the stirring dust on every side. Beyond it were the black corners, the sections of the room that the hub and the Trojan suns never reached, where fat demons and the shapes of Dirk's fears hunched obscurely, forever safe from scrutiny. Smiling and rubbing his chin, stubble covered his cheeks and jaw and he was starting to itch. Dirk studied those corners and let the dark dawn music back into his soul. How he had ever tuned it out he was not sure, but now it was back and all around him. The tower they were in, their home, sounded its long, low note. Years away, or centuries, a chorus answered in ringing widow's wails. He heard shuddering throbs and the screams of abandoned babies and the slippery sliding sound of knives slicing warm flesh and the drum. How could the wind beat a drum, he thought. He didn't know. Perhaps it was something else, but it sounded like a drum, so terribly far off, though, and so alone so horribly, endlessly alone. The mists and the shadows gathered in the farthest, dimmest corner of their room and then began to clear. Dirk saw a table and a low chair, growing from the walls and floor like strange plastic vegetables. He wondered briefly what he was seeing them by. The sun had moved a little and only a thin beam of light was trickling through the window now and finally that snapped off too and the world was grey. When the world was grey, he noted, the dust did not dance. No, not at all. He felt the air, to be sure. There was no dust, no warmth, no sunlight. He nodded sagely. It seemed that he had discovered some great truth. Dim lights were stirring in the walls, ghosts waking for another night, phantoms and husks of old dreams. All of them were grey and white, Color was only for the living and had no place here. The ghosts began to move. They were locked into the walls, each of them. From time to time, Dirk thought he could see one stop its furious dancing and beat helplessly and hopelessly against the glass walls that kept it from the room. Wraith hands pounding, pounding, yet the room shook not at all. Stillness was a part of these things. The phantoms were just that, all insubstantial, and pound though they might, finally they must return to dancing. The dance, the dance macabre, shapeless shadows, oh, but it was beautiful, moving, dipping, writhing, walls of grey flame, so much better than the dust motes, these dancers, they had a pattern, and their music was the song of the siren city. Desolation. Emptiness, decay, a single drum, beaten slow, alone, alone.